Welcome to the third installment of the Time Splitters Iceberg. This is where we get into some of the craziest aspects of Time Splitters development and lore and theories. It's just gonna be a wild ride from here to the very end. Before I go any further into the video, I want to make a correction. I made a mistake in the part 2 Time Splitters Iceberg video. The Assault for Time Splitters 4 map was not made by a Free Radical Design employee. That was actually another map called E Apocalypse the IGN Wars. Assault for Time Splitters 4 was made by Admiral Howdy, a prolific map maker in the community who's made a lot of cool custom maps. I'd recommend checking them out sometime. So yeah, to clarify, I probably should have swapped out those maps on the iceberg, but I had mixed them up and believed that that was the FRD made map and not the EA Apocalypse one. Given what I've read on the same Eurogamer article, I think it's safe to say that Time Splitters 1 was definitely rushed in time for the PS2 launch. So I'm going to bump that up from a weak theory to a potential fact. I feel like there's enough evidence based off of what the Free Radical employees said to show that it was made more or less to fit the launch timetable. I don't mean rushed in a bad way, but more in the sense that they needed to get the game out. And it was sort of a frantic project to see what all they could accomplish within that short span of time. Some of the points will be uh, either condensed anyway, or eliminated, like the one about Homefront the Revolution. Because I already covered that in the previous section, and everybody already knows about Homefront having all the Time Splitters 2 in it. So what you're gonna have here are some of the craziest but genuinely true facts, some very out there theories that still have some room to stand on, and some jokes and I'll be sure to say which is which to not get things confused. Let's get right into it. This is gonna be fun. Part five, the lower iceberg. This is where we cover stuff that is officially getting into more obscure territory. Stuff that you probably wouldn't know unless you've dug deep into Time Splitters discords or any sort of research into their development or aspects of their betas. It's just very strange, and that's why I'm looking forward to covering this part. Disc Launcher. The Disc Launcher was a planned weapon for Time Splitters 2. We all know what it looks like because it's only referenced in some of the demo builds of Time Splitters 2. It was cut before release, so. In the end, we don't know how it would have functioned. Presumably, it would have been a gun that launched disc-like uh, projectiles. It's unclear whether it would have been like an explosive weapon or if it had zoom or anything, but it could be dual-wielded. I think I actually may have found the sound for the disc launcher. I was testing out different sounds, trying out some of the gaps between the known ones to see if any remainders from TS1 were there. And there were, but there were also some strange sounds that I hadn't heard elsewhere in the game. Like this one, that I think might have been used by the disc launcher. Blunderbuss Times 2. The Blunderbuss Times 2 was a planned weapon for Time Splitters 1. One of the only ones that got cut, I think. You can find it in some early trailers of Time Splitters 1. It's unknown why you can't dual wield the Blunderbuss. I guess maybe to differentiate it from the regular double barrel shotgun. But ultimately, it got scrapped, so you can only single wield the Blunderbuss in game. Most Time Splitters 1 protagonists are villains. This is a theory, but I think there's good evidence to back it up. Time Splitters 1 has a very loose story and it leaves you to fill in the blanks of what's going on. There's plenty about it that 
the protagonists may don't seem to be in the best light. I think some of the strongest examples of this are in Chemical Plant and in Docks, although I think other levels apply too. In Chemical Plant, you're killing cops and other people just so you get your hands on some diamonds that you and presumably another gang member stole. In Docks, you're shooting and killing soldiers to collect a ransom and escape with it. And even in the other levels, you aren't exactly being an upright person. I mean, it comes with the territory, but there's a fine line between shooting the bad guys and shooting people just, just for the sake of it. In Spaceways, you shoot up a futuristic airport in Chinese. You massacre a restaurant full of gangsters without trying to arrest or apprehend any. In Tomb, for all we know, those cultists might have just been random guys that Captain Nash decided to gun down so he could take their unk. Is that how you pronounce it? Unk? In Cyberdown, there's a whole theory about the cyborgs there, but I'm going to save that for one of the lower tiers of this. But it's just, I firmly believe that not all of the time splitters one protagonists are villains. Some of them are genuinely heroic or fighting against evil forces like in Mansion, where you're battling zombies that are haunting a mansion. But at least a decent chunk of them are uh, less than stellar people doing some pretty bad things. Blue Robot. Blue Robot is a cut character from Time Splitters 1, one of the few ones I know of. Ryan and UK did a video on it too. It's sort of this uh, floating white and blue turret looking robot. He kind of looks like the med unit from Future Perfect. He can be spawned as a bot, and you can kill him and all that, but he doesn't really work very well on his own. By default, if you try to put him in the menu, it'll appear upside down. It's unknown where he would have been. Most likely guess would have been spaceways, judging by his color palette. But ultimately, a lot of this is just up to speculation. It's strange, it's one of the few things in Time Splitters 1 that did get cut. A lot of the stuff in there got used at the end of the day, with the exception of stuff like vehicles that maybe I'll explore at another point. Berserker Splitters come from Portal Demon DNA. This one, I think there's pretty good evidence for. The Berserker Splitters are, have a pretty unique design among the Time Splitters. They're bigger, bulkier, they've got distinct teeth, and they have a bipedal design, but they usually walk on all fours. Visually, they look very similar to the Portal Demon, or the Cropolite, the boss at the end of, or near the end of Notre Dame. I don't, I don't think that's a coincidence either. The Portal Demon's described as a creature from another dimension that was lured to there by the Time Splitter's evil magic. I think that when the Portal Demon was defeated, some of its DNA was harvested and used in the creation of these new Time Splitters. Since the Time Splitters were already there and present, the Scourge Splitters show up at the end of the level to stop me from killing Jack de la Mort. So, they look very similar. They're known to be connected through that evil magic or whatever it is. And they have a similar build and proportion. I even did a reskin in Time Splitters 2 that makes the crop of light look like a pretty convincing Berserker Splitter. So uh, only a theory, but I think it's a pretty strong one. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Time Splitter just brought the portal demon into Notre Dame. I think that they had similar goals in mind of causing havoc among humanity, and when the portal demon was defeated, they managed to use some of its DNA to create their next breed of Time Splitter. Time Splitter's Future Perfect Detachable Zombie Limbs. In Time Splitter's 2, you could shoot the heads and limbs off of zombies, whereas in the other games it was just the head. Future Perfect actually has support for this. With an action replay code, you can shoot off zombie limbs again. It was probably cut because in Future Perfect, zombies carry weapons, and I don't know how they would have handled that if you shot off a limb that was carrying like a shotgun or a baseball bat or something. It would have been interesting to see how they handled it, but maybe they just didn't have enough time to get that sort of behavior hammered down. 
It's tougher, though, to shoot off zombie limbs in that game. Proportions are a little thinner and aiming's a little tougher. But it's possible, and it can be re-enabled. Time Splitter's Mayhem. Time Splitter's Mayhem was another fan game. This one, not as much is known about it. I'm not even sure how much of it got completed. At some point it got abandoned. Uh, it did not get as far as Time Splitter's Gold, as far as I know. Soviet Union never fell. This is based off of just some context from Siberia. For reference, the Soviet Union in our world fell in 1991. This is after serious economic issues and the drain that its war in Afghanistan put on it. But in the Siberia level, which is set in 1990, Soviets seem to be doing pretty well for themselves. Their military installations are well-staffed, well-defended. They've got pretty advanced tech, like several rocket-launching machine gun turrets, a gunship on site to use against enemies. They're doing experiments with super soldiers using Reaper Splitter DNA. Oh, I mean, they even have laser fences. I, it seems like, based off the context, they're holding up well and they aren't on the brink of collapse. I mean, it could just be in this case that this is a very well-funded facility, but there isn't any evidence to suggest that it's about to fall, like it did in our world. A nation on the brink of collapse, I'm not sure if they would be blowing their money on superfluous stuff like super soldier projects and that sort of research. Arcade League is canon. It sounds like a silly theory at first, but I think there's some evidence to back this up, and. Just hear me out on this. Arcade League has some scenarios that actually tie into character backstories or different aspects of the main levels. Like how Hatchet Sal had a cheese-induced nightmare in his gallery. That's mentioned, and that's why he stopped using that weapon. And you actually play that nightmare in one of the Arcade League levels. Some of the military training levels in Time Splitters 2 seem to line up with the way they're, they were handling like the portals going on, the time portals, and it just seems like some aspects of it are believable. This is something that's actually happened within the context of the story. Sillier stuff like uh, Cortez and Corporal Hart playing Capture the Bag with the Time Splitters, I, I mean, you can probably dismiss that, and it's just a silly side story. But there seem to be some things about Arcade League that would work within canon or wouldn't contradict canon. And the whole, all the storylines about the circus characters, they seem to fit without contradicting anything either. This is sort of a eye of the beholder thing, but I think some of the Arcade League matches in Time Splitters 2 and Future Perfect actually happened within the storyline of the games. Part 6. The Bottom of the Iceberg If you thought things were strange before, they're only going to get stranger from here. Got some very interesting facts, some odd but very believable theories, and some jokes. Some of this stuff might be obscure for even the most die-hard of Time Splitters fans. I'm looking forward to detailing some of this stuff. So, to start out, we've got another Second Sight reference. You can tell I'm a fan of the game. Second Sight assets in Time Splitters 2. Second Sight was one of Free Radical's first games they wanted to work on. They never got around to releasing it until 2004, but there were plans to work on it. There were assets made while Time Splitters 2 was in development. You can find an early model of its protagonist, John Vadic, in the game. You can't get it to load in multiplayer or in arcade or anything. It just loads up uh, R107's model instead. It's unknown if you can get him to load. I'd imagine you'd have to maybe like replace his model using like some sort of pack modification. There's also a song from Second Sight that goes unused in Time Splitters 2, and some uh, 
serious sounding assault lines that sound like they could have belonged in Second Sight. That part is speculation though. But there are definitely some parts of Second Sight, some assets that slipped through the cracks and made it in the Time Splitters too. Ramona Sosa was Ramona Cortez. In the early builds of Time Splitters 2, Ramona Sosa was called Ramona Cortez. It's unknown if she was going to be related to Sergeant Cortez from the main storyline, but it's never explored. They probably gave her a different last name to differentiate them and to avoid any sort of confusion as a result of that. Time Splitters interfered in the Vietnam War. Okay, this one's a joke. I just thought about, like, the challenge where you're fighting through the Vietnam level in Future Perfect and I just thought it'd be funny to imagine like what if the US lost the war because the time splitters prevented them from winning there's nothing to it there's no evidence to back this up it's not a theory or anything else monsters in graveyard this one is sort of a joke but at the same time it's not really it's complicated Graveyard is sort of like Warzone in spaceways. There are sound effects that can play in the background. Also like Maul, where like it, instead of announcements you're hearing like raven calls, uh, crows cawing, other spooky sounds. Occasionally you'll hear some sort of like uh, monster noises. You'll never see anything though, only the enemies and allies that are already placed in there. After all. There are no monsters in the Time Splitters games, right? <laughs> the Abstract Tile Set The Abstract Tile Set was a cut tile set, a very little known one from the Time Splitters Future Perfect preview build. It still exists in the final game, but it doesn't really work. It crashes if you try to make a level in it. You can enable it with action replay. It's sort of like the Time Splitters 1 virtual tile set. It's a very under detailed, sort of like a simple white block tile set that reused some assets from other uh, uh, tile sets. I believe it used the lab uh, tile set music. You can make levels for it within the preview build and it should work fine. To give you a better idea of how it looks, those uh, there's little images of how uh, of how a tile would look within the menu of the map maker. That's how it looks. They, it seems like they wanted to make use of those little tiles themselves as a bonus. That way you could make sort of, uh, as the name suggests, more abstract tile set and make it more malleable for changing colors and that sort of stuff. It's unknown why they cut it. If it's like the Gothic tile set, they probably ran out of time to fix the issues with it. Because it crashes due to an issue with the doors and windows in the final game. Haze is canon. Haze is not canon. This is a joke. I... Haze could have been a good game, but Ubisoft really mismanaged it and turn it from a third-person, squad-based game with a serious tone into this ridiculous first-person shooter where people drop terrible lines like, These guys drop like Skittles! And, I was a boxer. Haze has a lot of potential, but it's awful. And I hope it is never made canon. The only thing I'll say is that I really like the design for the Mantle Troopers. And it'd be neat if they made it into a Time Splitters fan game at some point. The Beta Electro Tool Alt Fire. In the Time Splitters 2 Beta, the Electro Tool had a special Alt Fire attack, where you would charge it up and it would shoot off an explosive lightning bolt that would deal heavy damage. Kind of similar to the Future Perfect Alt Fire attack, but this one in the Future Perfect game is not explosive, it's more like just a standard pistol round that it shoots off, a smaller lightning bolt. It still works, you need to fix some lines of code in the final game. Uh, it's mentioned in the GameCube ISO document how to do that. And one of my mods, uh, Time Splitters 2 Tense Present, actually enabled it so, as an attack. 
overall, it's a pretty cool feature. I guess they removed it because they thought it'd be overpowered. The Electro Tool gets a ton of ammo throughout Robot Factory. It'd be pretty easy to just stun robots and then blow them up at the same time without changing weapons. Time Splitters 1 Splitters Merge from Humans. This is strange, but it's actually true. If you look carefully at the designs for the original two Time Splitters from the first Time Splitters game, they have a very distinct human like appearance. The second one in particular almost looks like he's emerging from a human being. And they definitely have more of a. not so much gory, but a mismanaged crude, human-like appearance. I believe Free Radical confirmed that that was an idea that we're going to go with, that the Time Splitters would split out of humans and arrive that way. And you can see this, actually, in the other games, like in 2 and Future Perfect, if you look at the two mutants from the Time Splitters, they have that sort of appearance going on. Both the hybrid mutant and the freak have these time splitter like features pushing out of their human features, like the growths on the hybrid mutant's shoulders, or the way the freak's face is expanding to include a berserker splitter like maw. It's pretty gross, but it's how they would have operated. It's never really gone into detail, as far as I know, within canon, but I think it's a genuine part of Time Splitter's lore. Story is in reverse chronological order. Okay, this is a theory, one of those ones, you give or take, you might not believe it, but I think there's some evidence to back it up. So, there's stuff within the Time Splitter's storyline that doesn't make sense going from start to finish. In Time Splitter's 2, Cortez takes control of Harry Tipper, an Adam Smasher, but in Future Perfect, which should take place later, he doesn't recognize Harry Tipper when he meets him. In Future Perfect, Captain Ash recommends that Cortez use some dynamite on a door, and Anya comments that he's got experience with dynamite. But he didn't use that at all in the second game. In essence, the story makes the most sense if you look at it backwards. Because in the third game, Jacob Crow makes the time splitters. In the second game, the Time Splitters take the time portal that they use to create havoc throughout history, both in Time Splitters 2 and in Time Splitters 1. Going backwards to forwards, it makes sense that way. A bit of a stretch, but chronologically, if it's in reverse order, everything adds up a little easier. Cyborgs are second-class citizens. This is an excellent theory that I would definitely recommend checking out sometime. It completely recontextualizes the events of Cyberden, the strange anachronisms in Time Splitters 1, and some other aspects of the story. Like why Sergeant Cortez would be taking orders from someone ranked lower than him, or why Corporal Hart would be completely ignored in Future Perfect outside of one reference. The whole idea is that cyborgs are second class citizens. They're seen as inferior to humanity. Whatever their plans were in Cyberden, likely to escape the planets, they had vast technological advances on their side. The raid in Cyberden led humanity to obtain those advances, leading to things like flying cars in Neo Tokyo, laser weapons by then, in 2020, exploring space, encountering aliens, and 2035, going fully into space travel with basically the equivalent of airports for space in the form of spaceways. It would also explain why cyborgs only really gained some respect after the machine wars, where a lot of the resistance fighters were cyborgs one way or another. I'll post a link to the full theory in the description. It's excellent. I'd highly recommend giving it a read, and shout out to the original creator of it.